school yeah. full room. Yeah. It's pretty empty. Yeah. 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 So, what's that? What's that? Told him it was a real nice place for me. Okay. Pizza sitting around like that, thinking we can put this and heat it up. We've been broadcasting on the I think I'd have to see CD then. It looks good. Well, this is from here. That's on that Astro track. Oh, 135 millimeter. 135? Yeah, it's a new version of it. like the version 6. I can't get motivated, but I haven't made it. What are you getting like? See, Ernst pulls it fast and he says, Oh, I'm going to stop doing it for talk. No, he ain't. He's doing it with the kids at the school. Yeah. He's using their equipment. Uh, yeah, he, he, he makes it easier. Yeah, it's all right. All right. He is the curator. Right? So he's on. <laughs> well, we have fun with the kids. Well, you know, it's just one room. We have fun with them. He's a nice kid. Yeah. Yeah. Has questions. Mm -hmm. I told them. I I tried to put myself in his shoes, and I said, you know, I said as we're going through school, I'm not doing this math. And this Okay, this is a test. I know we're live on the internet. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. People of Earth. People of Earth. I just said, you know, the process thing is all statistical analysis. I said, so a lot of math involved. Now, I tried to give him some sense of, you know, why he's studying math and so on. I think we got a kick out of it, though. Can you see me in the video birth? Uh, you see my head? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, let me help you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I've seen that good. scene in Predator. <laughs> yes. That, that's what it was. Thank you you. missed it. <laughs> it was a twin beam. Uh, uh, you with the question. Actually, if we do this right, we don't move. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little yeah. under, Jim, but you're there. I don't have it on. Okay, Mike's on now. Yeah, I, uh, as far as exposure, you're a little under. Uh, uh, that's a good you know, the thing is so yeah, now they have yeah. to yeah. so yeah. 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 have a hiss stuff eventually. Uh, you know, once there's snow down. My sister, my mother wants to go to South Thank you, my sister. Very good. Question. No, one of the hands is too no one ever comes to see me. No one ever comes to see me. It's just a second. No one ever comes to see me. It's just a second. No one ever comes to <laughs> these are hundred dollar seats. These are seventy five. Oh, look for you. What's going on? Hey. Nice. Yeah. Careful, I feel like I know my money's worth. Cares roll. Oh. They're all just to let everybody know, it's so very great to see everybody. We do have a microphone up here, and we are streaming live right now to YouTube, so please be careful with what you're saying. I will trim it out a little later, but best to be cautious. Earth, Earth to Mars. Uh, and good. Good? Hey, we gotta do this for a living, you know. <laughs>
more Jewish stuff. Yes. Are you? Uh, you know any details about that poem? Huh? They're a school for you're all right from Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh, really? It's a bit the same. Where is that? New Hope. New Hope. Oh, right. Awesome. Ooh. It's really place in Pennsylvania, I know. Yeah. Well, it's a good city. <laughs> Sorry. It could be Solberg. It is Solberg. I'm going to say no. People who are already watching all the time. Prince Clair Corporation. Yes. He just <laughs> hey Bruce, Bruce, can you see the laser pointer on the screen? Yes. Uh, laser, pointer, laser pointer on the screen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Hi, welcome. What is the place for the We have a group here. No, normally, um, we would uh, add to the to the wonder of the universe by uh, having scopes outside and having a 26 inch scope. Uh, up and available for viewing, like we do every public night. But uh, it's cloudy. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, but yeah. when you're done, um, go up. For those of you who've never been here, and those who've been here, and we'll see it again. We have a 26 inch, so you would just go through the side door here and wind all the way up to the uh, uh, to the dome, and then take a look at the scopes that we have. We've been around for a long time, and uh, the park loves us. Um, we're an organization that um, is, is a bitch, but uh, if anyone really likes what they see here, uh, there's a donation box. We, we survive on donations and, uh, and membership, so uh, that should be said. We do sell some drinks and water if, you, if you'd like. And uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so don't forget to to go upstairs before you leave. And then come back. This is the last public night of this year. Uh, sometime in late December and through January, we can't even get through because they don't plow the roads. You just feel like we're in New Hampshire, but we're not. You know, they just don't plow the roads. Uh, sometime even into February. So uh, even though we're, we're active through the whole winter season, and there's a lot of active members, active photography and a variety of other things. Um, we, yeah, the public nights resume again in February, on the fourth week of February, and then every single Saturday from uh, uh, Memorial Day through to Halloween. Every Saturday we have a crew here from 8.30. I say 8.30 to 10.30, but it's really 8.30 till the last person leaves. <laughs> and uh, really, it's how it is every time. And on Sundays, again, from Memorial Day through Halloween, we have um, uh, afternoon, Sunday afternoons open. And you say, well, again, what am I going to look at in Sunday afternoon? We have a hydrogen alpha scope that allows us to see prominences and other features on the sun. So it's pretty, it's, it's really neat. It's, uh, you know, and it's worth, oh, my folks, I got a message. And uh, it differs from the one that I often get when I'm driving. <laughs> so you get it. Okay, then get it. All right. Uh, anyway. <laughs> it's a hand signal. I get different hand signals. Anyway, you get it now? Yes. Oh, okay. I got one tonight. That's a slow move. You're going to have a tough time with that. 
Anyway, okay. Work on uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, I want to introduce you. He'll, he'll talk more about himself. So I'm going to introduce you to our president and uh, astrophotographer extraordinaire. Uh, I understand you were just uh, uh, observing photo graphing uh, uh, Eris in, yes. uh, in the Kuiper belt. Mm. You know what the Kuiper belt is? Oh, it's that belt of objects that are out there. Are they called Plutinos? Sure. Yeah, I think Plutinos, Plutos <laughs> included, out beyond, in, within Neptune's orbit and beyond. And they have erratic orbits, and it's so cool. And there's so much to learn and like. Enjoy yourselves. And here is our president, Jim Roselli. And Thank you. give him a hand. Thank you. Wow, very cool. This is a cell phone. Please turn your ringer off <laughs> before we start. Inevitably, there'll be one or two and i uh, got to answer the call. So we have a special group here tonight, which is wonderful, from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what part? New Hope. New, Hope. New Hope, Pennsylvania. And which school? Solberry School. Solberry School. Yeah. And this is the science class? Astronomy, Astronomy Club. Astronomy Club. Even more better. <laughs> Astro nerd class. Well, you know what? <laughs> Much, yeah. Welcome. I, I apologize for the lack of clear skies, but you know, in New Jersey, it's been a little challenging um, for the last several weeks. So, thank you for everybody being here. We are live streaming, so please be cautious with what you say. Um, although I could edit it out later, but I won't do that. Um, I'm Jim Roselli. It's my privilege, and I sincerely mean that, to be the president of the New Jersey Astronomical Association. We have a huge staff here of qualified observers and people that truly make this organization operate. Um, with that, after our uh, presentation tonight, which will make it uh, pretty quick and painless for you, uh, we'll give you a tour of the facility. If we certainly had some clear skies, we'd be able to do some observing um, if you would. And we're always available for questions afterwards. So the topic tonight, star magnitude and astronomical distances, um, Maybe from New Jersey. We'll, we'll start with that if you would. Um, it's interesting when I started doing uh, research and as you learn about astronomy and star magnitude and, and et cetera, et cetera, that um, things are a little bit crazy with regard to how far away things are and how bright things are and how they are, uh, how they are uh, uh, scaled and we, and we have scales for that. So when we're talking about star magnitudes, we're really talking about stars that are dim, stars get pretty bright, but there's two ways to talk about magnitude. One is apparent magnitude, and the apparent magnitude is, hey, I can see it here from Earth, I look up, and apparently that's my magnitude that I see. Okay? The second one is absolute, and it's uh, absolute magnitude, and that's more of a scientific um, scale, uh, a scientific approach to the number. And it really says, I'm assuming that every star is going to be uh, 10 parsecs away. We'll learn about parsecs a little bit later as part of this uh, stellar distance. And we're saying that there's these two types of magnitudes. So when you typically hear about star magnitude, it's apparent. And if you see research papers and things where they're being very specific about the luminosity of something, they're talking about the, uh, the absolute magnitude. Anybody ever heard of inverse square law? Anybody a photographer? Of course, a couple of people here. So, one of the um, uh, unique properties of um, photons, particles of light, is that as they spread out and the further they go, they actually diminish in the amount and intensity that they have. And the square law says, very simply, is that the intensity of the source, and we're, I'll use the term flux here, and flux is a term that can be used for many different things. Could be gravity, could be magnetism, could be photons and luminosity. So for our purposes, the flux is luminosity and photons. So it's the, the um, inverse square law says that the reciprocal of the distance squared is actually how much light's going to arrive at you. So as you have a light source uh, from the point to its first radius, if you would, that would be considered one. If you go out to the second radius of that, it's really pretty simple. You just do the math. It's two times two is four, put a one in front of it, reciprocal. You're actually getting one-fourth of the light. Okay? 
move three times the distance away, do the same trick, simple math, you get one ninth of light. So it's an incredible diminishing of um, the amount of light <coughs> as it gets further and further away. But the inverse square law is important uh, with regard to learning about how bright things are and when we start scaling them from one magnitude to the other, well, what are those, uh, what are those changes numerically? This is a, and I, could, I, I couldn't find who made this chart, but it's the coolest little chart that I found out on the Internet. And I promise, Internet, um, I'll, put, I'll give you credit for it if I can find you on there. Edmund Scientific. Edmund, Edmund Scientific. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Very cool. That's why we have nerds here. <laughs> That's a good thing. <coughs> so... It, this really it gives you a, uh, a packed amount of information into a very, very small area. And they're talking about magnitude, the, these numbers here, and they, they go from zero, which would be considered the baseline, and they get to minus. So the inverse square law is going backwards. Well, if it's minus, it must be dimmer. No, it means it's brighter. Okay, and the whole numbers are actually get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer all the way down that you go. And there's a property associated with this. Every star... Every magnitude difference is 2.51 times dimmer or brighter than its predecessor. And that scales up enormously quick. So this is a quick chart. You can find it out on the internet. Uh, and it'll give you some information with regard to that. So I looked at it and I say, you know what, I really want to extrapolate the numbers even more. So magnitude is a scale for measuring astronomical brightness of objects. It could be a point source, like a star. It could be a galaxy. When you measure the light emitted from a galaxy, it has a magnitude too. And any time that you look up any references for anything that's astronomical, it'll show you what an absolute and what the apparent magnitude is. <coughs> we specifically see brightness actually similar in the way that we hear sound. For us to hear a difference in sound, we actually have, it actually have to have twice as much power for us to notice the difference. Same way with light. So we, we look and we hear and we see things logarithmically. So taking this to the next step is with regard to the brightness magnitudes, things getting brighter and brighter and brighter. If we start, um, if we look, as I said before, each magnitude is 2.51 times brighter than its predecessor, if you want. Remember, Vega was down there at zero, so Vega is the baseline. It just happens to be magnitude zero, that's why it's the baseline. Uh, but as we go up and things are getting brighter and brighter, each step, 2.512, 2.512, 2.512. 2 and the fifth time that we get up there, <coughs> excuse me, we actually achieve, oh, it's 100 times that. If you take the calculator, 2.5, and you do that, it actually comes up to 100. And that literally is linear and scales right up like that, if you would, Okay. So it's pretty straightforward math, but if we start looking at how bright things are, Vega comes in at zero, Sirius, Jupiter. Oh, Jupiter is minus two. <coughs> Venus, pretty, uh, the full moon is a minus 13 with regards to uh, magnitude. And you know when you have a full moon, you can actually walk. There's a lot of light by the full moon. You can actually do photography quite successfully um, with just the light of the moon. And we keep going up, and we keep going up, and these numbers are getting huger and huger and huger until we get all the way up to the sun, which is a minus 26, which is enormously bright, if you would. One of the reasons it's so bright, it's pretty close. It's actually in our backyard in the neighborhood. Okay. So all of these magnitudes, each one is two and a half times brighter than the other one, and you just go up the scale. Okay. The same is true for the dimmer magnitudes. On the way down... We start, um, we start the other direction, and with Vega there, then we start going this way. And, hey, you know what? I, sh I left the, mark I left the uh, integers. I wanted to make that all two. We'll go with that. So as we look at the stars, again, two and a half times, two and a half times, two and a half times, and you get here. So we can see some of the favorites. Um, uh, Neptune is, as an example, is magnitude 8. Uh, and there's something really, really important here. That's called naked eye um, limiting magnitude. And that says our eyes, if our eyes are dark adapted. So you're sitting in this room right here right now, and we have a lot of light for lots of reasons so we can capture the video and send it out. But if you were to go outside, you'll notice immediately you don't see all the stars. It takes a period of time to do that. We see as a chemical reaction with regard to 
our eyes. We are known as trichromats. We see in three colors, red, green, blue. And it's actually a chemical reaction. We see with rods and cones. Cones are the color, rods are black and white. We're infinitely more sensitive with um, the rods, so our night vision is really, really great. But it takes a certain amount of time to get there. At approximately one half hour, your eyes are completely dark adapted, assume, assuming that there's no bright light in the area, that you're in a really dark area, and let's say it's a new moon where there's no moonlight, and you just have the stars. And if you're out west, it's really, really cool because you see a lot of stuff. At that point, that's when you're dark adapted, and you'll be able to see at that magnitude, and you'll see a lot of stars like that. The instant somebody turns on a white light or a flashlight, your eyes go back, and it takes you half an hour again to actually get back to that state. That's why if you're ever invited to a star party, you never want to drive up with your lights on. I know that's hazardous, but you want to be very careful. Yes? Here it says each magnitude is 2.152, but there on the paper it says 2.512, so the, the numbers two point, are wrong. Two point, this, this is wrong. Uh. This is wrong. Sorry, good correction. Thank you. Um, so when you're, uh, when you're arriving at a star party, be cautious with regard to lights. And if you bring lights, put a red cellophane on the uh, uh, flashlight, if you would. So your eyes have the ability to see magnitude 6 star up to a magnitude 6. Anything that's fainter than that, you're basically not going to see, even in the best, most remote locations out west or in other parts of the, uh, of the country, if you would. Okay? What's really, uh, to me, astounding is when we start looking at uh, the magnitudes, and remember, each one is two and a half times dimmer than its predecessor. You know, 100 times, 200 times, 300 times, and the factor is enormous. And the Hubble telescope is down here at magnitude 30, which is, you know, I think it's uh, insane how sensitive and what it can resolve in the sky. And certainly when you think about some of the accomplishments of the Hubble Space Telescope, especially with their deep field and ultra deep field um, images that they've done. Is everybody familiar with those? Heard about those pictures that they took? The ultra deep field is where Hubble took, I think, approximately 200 hours of staring at the same spot of the sky. And there's a remarkable, there's an image, there's an image later on that you'll see this. And remarkably, absolutely everything in that image was galaxies going all the way back to what they think is um, the creation. So the eyes, you want to um, just recognize you're only going to see so much. Um, you want to be in a dark sky spot. You want to make sure that you're a dark adapted. So if you're absolutely in that pristine area out west um, in one of the national parks where they have turned off all the lights and it's a new moon, you can see an incredible amount of stars that are actually at that magnitude. So for the northern hemisphere, we're all things being considered perfect, you're going to see 4,500 stars. So as compared to being in New York City looking up, you're never going to be dark adapted because your eyes will never be void of the light that's there and the light pollution that's there, if you would. Okay. And there's a number, um, you know, when we start looking at the, the magnitudes um, of the stars, you, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting the amount of light that they have, and then we're going to learn about this, and the distance that they're, they're actually away. So if you have something that's really bright and really close, it's going to give you a, a, a relative magnitude. If that moves further and further away, it's going to look dimmer and dimmer as, as it goes along. There's a very cool chart that's out there. It's called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And this chart has an enormous amount of information in it with regard to stars, their luminosity, their life, where they are. We are, um, if you would, right here on the sun, and we're considered a main sequence star, okay? And our lifetime is 10 to the 10 years, if you would. And there's other stars that are much larger, and you see them on the wall here, uh, Betelgeuse as an example, supergiants. And there's other, there's other ones that are very small. The color temperature um, changes, and also their life along these uh, lines change. So this is a uh, this chart is very very informative with regard to the size, the mass, um, the luminosity stars, and how long they'll actually last. 
And the good news is, our, you know, our, our sun's going to be around for a great period of time because it's a main sequence star. So all things being said, with regard to star magnitude, the one problem that we, <laughs> the one problem that we have, is say, well, it's really great that we can see 4,500 stars. Um, the challenge that we have is we have an enormous amount of light pollution in the United States. And there's some wonderful apps that are out there on Androids, iPhones, and iPads to show you dark spots uh, in the United States. So um, that big white spot, you know, we're over here. Um, I want to be over here. <laughs> you know, I want to be over here, stuff like that. Um, and there are, are actually a couple of areas on the eastern seaboard. Adirondacks is one where it's a fairly dark spot. And actually in Pennsylvania, Cherry Springs, Pennsylvania, is an enclave where um, it's surrounded. It's surrounded by mountains, and it's fairly, uh, fairly good for viewing. Also, so we all have to deal with light pollution with regard to seeing things. So our observatory uh, right here, we are actually part of uh, the app. So if you get the Dark Sky app, you'll be able to look at all the places in the United States. I've registered us to be on there so that we can understand that um, the observatory itself. You know, we'd love to be in a perfect area, but we're not. Light pollution is something that we're always battling. But that being said, we still do, on a new moon evening, we still can see the Milky Way. And it's a very, very impressive sight once your eyes are dark adapted. So the scale that um, is used is called the Bortle scale. We are on, we have a rating of five because of our light pollution. And essentially that's saying that... Um, we're suburban, we have a suburban sky, if, uh, if you would. And I recommend if anybody's interested, these apps I think are free. There's a dark sky app um, that you can use. So what is the difference uh, with regard to that? So inner, uh, inner city New York, there is a star there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a star. Oh, wait. There's a, uh, a couple. Okay. I'm not even sure if this is coming through. Uh, but this is a great uh, chart that's available out there um, on the internet. So as we're going along, we go from an inner city. So we can see an incredible 4,500 stars in pristine conditions. It's totally based upon literally location, location, location. If you're in New York and you look up, you know the majority of what you see is just the sky glow shine around you. And as you're going further out, so we are classified right here. Um, and, yep, we get to see more stars, but as you go further and further uh, to the dark sky lo locations, it's pretty incredible with regard to what you can see. I want to bring your attention to one thing. Here in New York City, there may be a star or two up there, but there's no stars on the horizon. The further out you go into the dark sky locations, you notice they're illustrating that there are stars on the horizon. And if you've ever been out west, way, way out west, driving between... Vegas with Vegas far behind you because of the sky glow and going to the dark uh, going to a dark uh, going towards Arizona gets very very dark as you're driving along your peripheral vision says what are those sparkles I see on the ground the stars on the horizon and it's it's like crazy but you go out to a dark it, it's the whole horizon that you get to see the stars it's a magnificent it's an incredible incredible sight if you would so if you ever get a chance to go out there, make sure you stop, pause, pull off the road, get dark adapted. But you'll absolutely see that. You'll see stars on the horizon. It's really a, it's really a remarkable uh, thing. So magnitudes are great. We have those down. But as I said, we're dealing with light pollution. So if you really want to have a great view with regard to the night sky, come up to the observatory or hustle out to a dark location closest to you and, and, uh, and look up if you would. It's great to see the stars, but I'm wondering how far they are away. And the one nice part about um, learning about this, <clears throat> it's interesting that when we consider the distances um, and what we need to deal with, to say that the to say that the numbers are astronomical is pretty much crazy, but they are. But they're so big and so huge that they're actually resolved down, we've, we've given them other names. So we, they, they're cataloged, if you would, in such a way that our backyard would be considered our solar system. 
Okay. Solar system's pretty good, but we'll consider that our backyard if you would. Our neighborhood M31 is the closest gal uh, galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy neighborhood. Uh, far away is the Virgo cluster. It's a huge cluster of galaxies, pretty far away. And far, far, far away, the Big Bang, this is actually the Hubble deep field um, um, picture that was taken. And in that particular image, and you can go to the Hubble Heritage website and download this image. It's spectacular. Um, if, you, if you take, uh, and you can use any uh, imaging program and you zoom in and you zoom in, you'll see that there's 10,000 galaxies in that image. 10,000 galaxies, okay? Tiny spot in the sky imaged in 200 hours. Pretty incredible. Your tax dollars at work, as a matter of fact, but it's wonderful. <laughs> so with regard to the distances, they're broken up into these categories. Um, solar system distances are um, probably the simplest and easiest. The distance from our self to the sun is called an astronomical unit, NAU. So when we're talking about our solar system, when we speak about the distances to uh, planets, you're not going to hear them in miles or kilometers etc. You're going to hear them with regard to AUs. So one AU is 93,000 miles if you would. Okay, That's considered one astronomical unit. And as we're going through, well now suddenly, oh, these are like, I can remember these numbers. They're pretty small. Well, I'll just remember each one of them is 93,000 miles. Okay, Million. So, Million. Million. No, million, thank you. Um, so when we're, when we're looking at this, just, yeah, I can edit that in YouTube. <laughs> that's just, you know, that's why I like AUs. Uh, but when you look at the numbers, they are um, much more understandable rather than having some uh, scientific notate, notation um, looking at you. But this is all for our, for our solar system or backyard. We use astronomical units for... Uh, for measurement. Component of where we're going next has to do with how fast things are traveling out there. Light is traveling, photons are traveling at a finite speed, 186,000 miles per second. Um, the distance that they go in one light year is known as a light year. Um, it's literally 5.8 roundup a light year is six trillion miles, okay? I say round up because as you begin looking at how they uh, actually arrive at these, at these distances and the measurement tools that they use, there's actually a lot of play, plus or minus a um, few million miles, plus or minus a few light years. You know what? Round up, light year, six trillion miles, if you would, okay? Mega distance, long distance away. So a light year, and you'll see that's uh, used in mostly everything with regard to distance. They'll, they'll say how far that is. The other thing for um, understanding distances is, is really, well, how do, I, how do I find the distance to a star? And one element of this is to actually understand the night sky and how the astronomers have sliced and diced the, the night sky up into these microscopic um, moments of time, if you would. So if we look at on an azimuth and we put uh, we just turn around 360 degrees, that's essentially what we're doing. Um, and then from there, each of each degree has uh, 60 arc seconds, yeah, 60 arc minutes, and each minute has 60 seconds. So there are 1,296,000 little pieces that we can chop the sky up to when we're, we're trying to find things. Okay. So when you hear arc minutes and arc seconds, just know that it's, it's a very small piece of the night sky that we're referring to. Astronomical distances are measured um, in parsecs, which stands for it's a parallax second. The distance to um, the star is known as one parsec if the difference in separation when it's measured is uh, one arc second. So if we go back and we say one degree, one minute, if it's within one 296,000th of a movement in the sky as an arc second, 
and a star moves, that'll basically say, oh, that star is one parsec away. And how that happens is the parsec says, well, you know what, here we are, 1 AU. Looks pretty small, right? 93 million miles. Here we are. And at one point of the time, we take a picture and we're saying, hey, where's the background star? We wait six months on our orbit, we take the same picture again, we say, where's the star? And we say, hey, did that move at all? Another illustration is, here we are. Oh no, this is bad. There it is, good. So this is the star we're looking at. Six months later, we take the same picture. Whoa, it moved. See it? So if it moved, that one arc second in the sky, that's considered to be one parsec away. Another um, way, and it, I was watching uh, some information about radio astronomy of the National Radio Observatory, and I thought it was pretty interesting. They were saying that one arc second of the sky is equal to one slice of pepperoni uh, at three miles away. I start, you know, as we were having pizza that I'm saying like, wow, pretty crazy. So, this, you know, obviously this is not the scale, but pepperoni slice is pretty small. But, you know, when you start moving something away, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's like, wow, three miles away? And you have a huge, it's, it's infinitesimally small. But it's that little distance that they're talking about, that star wobble, that star movement over time. That's how they're, that's how they're checking the distances and that's how they're, they're coming up with that. Okay? So a parsec is really 3.26 light years in distance. And... If you convert it over astronomical units, it's a bunch of astronomical units, 200,000 astronomical units, okay? This method of measuring stellar distances with regard to watching that little movement of a star against the background stars over uh, our orbital period around the sun is only good to about 100 light years out, okay? So, told you. <laughs> She buys pizza for everybody. No, I'm just <laughs> like your ringtone. Thank you. That's quite So here we are, and we think about our solar system, astronomical units, that's our backyard. So we're trying to measure stellar distances, and we know that stars go way beyond 100 light years. Yet this method of looking at uh, and finding this tiny slight movement of a star against the background is only good for measuring up to like 100 years. And by the way, again, that's give or take a bunch of light years with regard to uh, the distance there. As we start getting um, more and more into like how far away these things are, well, then they move into like it's just not parsecs or hundreds of parsecs. It's a kiloparsec, which is a thousand. It's a megaparsec. It's a gigaparsec. And here we go with the numbers. They're extraordinary, extraordinary numbers. But again, it keeps the numbers small for computational, for discussion purposes, but the, the distances are, are really extraordinary, extraordinarily far out there. So when it um, then understanding how do we uh, scale or how do we find the distances, there's some other methods that are used for that. So in our um, in our backyard, radar ranging, and radar ranging is actually useful, and there's some radar images of asteroids and things like that, which gives some pretty cool stuff. Uh, the stellar uh, parallax method, 100, so you got 100, 200, you know what? The numbers are so big, it's okay to be a little bit over and under in each area, okay? spectroscopic parallax so now we're getting into the colors that are there we're seeing a shift in colors and we're looking then for stars separate variables to take us out even further <coughs> up on the top we'll go towards uh we'll look for supernovas because supernovas stars that explode have a very 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 specific signature with regard to um, um uh, their, their, spectro, their spectroscopy and those use. And, and beyond that, they'll actually take 
and the look at the redshift, which is the Hubble constant that says this thing is so far away, and it's traveling so far away that the lines of the spectrum are actually going uh, one way or the other. If they're going to the red, they're moving away from us. They're going to the blue, uh, they're coming close to us. So when we begin looking um, then at uh, the Milky Way and say, where, where are we? Um, our sun is approximately there. The distance from there to the center of the Milky Way is 8,000, 8 kiloparsecs, or 8,000 parsecs. That's a huge distance. The next galactic scale that you would use for understanding time and distance is called the galactic, uh, galactic year, cosmic year. And it's actually in terrestrial years. So how long does it take for us to actually circumnavigate uh, around 360 uh, degrees around the galaxy? And it's going to be uh, a long time, if you would. So it takes a couple of hundred million terrestrial years, and that's calendar years in time, for us to absolutely go around it. And we're traveling at 514,000 uh, miles per hour. So the takeaway from the whole discussion tonight is to really understand the vast distances that are out there, number one. The scales that are used uh, for measuring our backyard, light year, uh, astronomical units, light years, and then to hopefully inspire the younger people, the young adults here, and those other people that are interested uh, in astronomy, to go out and actually do more research and find out and find out more information about things. You know, there's an ex there's a wonderful opportunity today um, with the technology. Almost everybody has a smartphone, applications, and if you all are in the astronomy class, you better have some astronomy apps right on your phones. <laughs> And the power that you have really at your hand, in your hands today, you have a, a, a planetarium that literally uh, researchers would die for just uh, not that many years ago. So it's an incredible time to be uh, interested in this. The technology is great. Technology is only going to, only, only going to get better, and if you would. So it's a great, you know, it's a great uh, opportunity to learn more. And there's so much information that's packed into these applications today. You can literally uh, take any of them and, and surf the night sky, get all the information about stellar distances, et cetera, et cetera, with that. So with that, I, I thank you for being here this evening. I hope that everybody um, recognizes organizations such as the New Jersey Astronomical Association with regard to what we're trying to do for the public. We're, we're here to educate. That's our mission. We hope to uh, inspire people to continue, you know, their love of astronomy. And if, certainly, if we had clear skies, we'd be breaking apart and going uh, viewing on the skies. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen tonight. So, are there any questions at all we can answer about the observatory, about the presentation at all? Yes, sir. Could you explain why we often have red light uh, in rooms to help us dark adapt to the light? Well, red, red is um, one of the colors that least affect our eyes with regard to the chemicals that um, are being produced. Um, a white light will invoke the, the rods in our eyes, which are very, very sensitive. And a red light um, is for the cones, which is a color. So it's one, it's, it's the least worst if you would. It still does impact you, but it doesn't impact you enough. Okay? And something you just want to, if you ever go to star parties, said things like that, you want to bring flashlights with uh, a red cellophane over the front of the uh, back. Oops. Hope that phone was protected. Yes? When you were doing the parallax um, and saying, looking at an object um, versus the background, you're assuming it's the background. How do you know it's the background? That's a great question because, you know, as we as we start looking at the sky, these things are so far away. We have the atmosphere over us, number one. The atmosphere actually um, is going to take and scrub a star and, and move a star. One of the compelling reasons to put the Hubble Space Telescope up in space was to be above the atmosphere. 
to be able to see beyond, have higher resolution and better scientific data as regard to that. So the instrumentation that they're using today now is so good and accounts for so much of this. They're looking for even sub arc, arc second movements in a star against the background over that period of time as a, ca as a calculation of the distance. So they're able to refine it to that point today and be able to successfully tell the differences. But it is, you know, it, it is subjective to, to some extent. It's based upon the quality of the instrumentation, the sky, et cetera, et cetera, and repeatability of what they're doing. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody being here this evening. I will, I will just, um, it's my solemn duty to say that we are a nonprofit organization. I know John spoke about it before, and John's our program director, and we have our observatory director here and our membership director. We rely on uh, personal assistance from everybody. We rely on donations. We receive nothing from the state. Nobody is compensated as part of the organization for what we're doing. Please, if you would, there's a donation uh, box in the back. Anything that you could help us with, support us, makes a huge impact, and we, we thank you for that. So with that, we're going to close. Um, we're going to open up the dome so you can see the scope. I'm assuming the sky is still cloudy, unfortunately. Yeah, we're, we're socked in. That's not going to happen. So, all right. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.